Adventure. Tonight, Ron Evans tells us of a 176-year-old mystery that is only today being unraveled in his story entitled The Ship of Death. Made another seven to eight months before you reach the next layer. By that time, I expect to be back in Egypt. I'll be looking forward to your return, Sir John. In the meantime, have a pleasant voyage home. Yes, the weather should be fine this time of the year. As for the Ranita artifact, I'm sure I shall find someone who can unravel the mystery. It was indeed a strange artifact. Mm, more secure than the vault of a bank. All I can say is that the ancient Egyptians must have greatly prized it. I agree, Sir John. However... Why did they bury it in such a way that it was unlikely to be ever found? Well, Nixon, that's the mystery that has yet to be solved. Not to mention the strange metal the statuette has been made from. Hmm. Ah, the gangway's about to be hauled in. Well, I'd better hurry. On voyage, Sir John. Oh, and to your daughter as well. Thank you, and don't forget, keep digging to the south. The tomb is certain to be in that direction. In the year 1807, a brig sailed from Alexandria, bound for London, with a number of artifacts dug out of the desert sand some 50 miles south of the Great Pyramids. Sir John Makewell was in charge of the archaeological dig, leading a team of eight experts. The brig was called the Mary Dean, and she never reached her destination. In fact, she never left the Mediterranean. The Mary Dean was never heard of again until last year, when some scuba divers off the coast of Crete spotted her at the 30-fathom level. Since the vessel was carrying rare artifacts for the British Museum and the British Archaeological Society, I was contracted to salvage all I could from the wreck. I found the brig to be remarkably well-preserved, and my team of divers began to salvage these relics. All except one. And what follows is my reconstruction of why the statuette of an unknown deity called Ranita was left at the bottom of the sea. On the second day out from Alexandria, Sir John Makewell had dinner with the vessel's master, Edward Boscombe, an old-timer on the verge of retirement. Some more wine, Sir John? Yes, Captain, it's excellent. I tell you. <clears throat> Stuart, bring another bottle. Yes, sir. Well, it must be interesting work you do out there in the desert. Indeed it is, Captain, although your own profession probably holds more excitement. Oh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> I must admit that finding the artifacts we have on board was the most exciting moment of my life. I'd like to hear about it if you don't object to the telling, sir. No, well, we'd uh, gone south from Giza looking for further burying places. Uh. All we found were endless sand dunes and rocky outcrops. Then we spotted what seemed from a distance a square building. When we approached, we found it was a half-buried block of stone, perfectly symmetrical and as smooth as the day it was hewn. This in itself was strange, because sand driven by the wind is a powerful abrasive. Well, after careful examination of this stone block, my assistant found several groups of hieroglyphics of a type hitherto unknown. Oh, that's a kind of writing, isn't it? That's right. The ancient Egyptians used a form of picture writing, but this was quite different, consisting of whirls, loops, and straight lines. I made a large clear impression of this, which is now in the hold. Perhaps some of our people in London can decipher it. Mm, how big was the block of stone, sir? Well, it was a perfect square with sides of 15 feet. Well, could it not have been made recently? There, there are people farther south in Africa which we know nothing about. No, it was buried too deeply. And the people you refer to would have had to have had uh, mathematical knowledge equal to our own to have produced such an object. Yeah. However, after some discussion, we concluded that this block must be either a marker or even the means of covering the entrance to an underground tomb. It took many weeks to dig up an area 20 feet round the block, and the sand revealed a number of minor artifacts of little value and several skeletons and mummified bodies. Not mummified by artificial means, I might add, but by the dryness of the desert where they'd been buried. Then nothing, but it cost the lives of two of our men when it collapsed at one point. <coughs> You, are you all right, Sir John? Yes. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. 
Just a cough that's affected me these last few days. Hmm. Edith, my daughter, is suffering from the, <coughs> the same trouble. Change in climate, I dare say. Where was I now? Uh, two men had died oh, there. yes, yes. So there we were, confronted by this gigantic block of seemingly meaningless stone. After some discussions, I had an idea. We could break the rock. Perhaps there was something hidden inside. Well, with all due respect, sir, wouldn't that be unlikely? Uh, since you said before, it had been hewn out. Oh, that's what we thought at the time. It was man-made, you mean? That's right, indeed it was, Captain Boscombe. It was as though it had been deliberately made to appear natural. But when it was struck, pieces broke off in powdery lumps. All the same, it took three days for us to reach the center. And that was where we found the statuette of Ranita, embedded in the center of the rock. And what or who was Ranita, Sir John? Well, something of a mystery deity. Vague mentions have been made of her. And all we know for certain is that she represented death in some ways. The goddess of death? Yes, I suppose you could say that. Hmm. And that's all you know of her, then? Only that the ancient writings suggest that she came from the sky and brought death in her wake. Sheer nonsense, of course, as we all know in this enlightened age. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Sir John. Ah, I spent all my life traveling the world. You can believe me when I say there are things out there that defy explanation. Ah, your daughter's coming into the saloon. I looked in your cabinet on the deck for you. Ah, sit down, my dear. I was just having an interesting chat with the captain. He was starting to tell me of some of the mysterious things he's seen during his lifelong travels. <laughs> I'm sure they would make interesting listening, but some other time, if you don't mind, Captain. You all right, Edith. You do look a little pale. I don't feel very well at all, Father. I have a dreadful headache, and my stomach feels as if it is turning itself inside out, if, if you will forgive the indelicacy. Well, perhaps the motion oh, of the ship... Uh, no, Captain, <laughs> I consider myself a good sailor. I have the beginnings of a headache myself. I had a bout of coughing, a cough just like yours, Papa. Perhaps a drop of wine will help your stomach, my dear. Oh, no, really, I can barely stand the sight of it. I shall retire early. Perhaps tomorrow it will have passed. Good night, Captain. Oh, good night, Miss Edith. And keep well wrapped up. I shall. Good night. Uh, well, if I may say so, Sir John, the young lady does appear to be ill. Oh, she's a strong girl, Boscombe. Tomorrow she'll be as right as rain. Uh, ah. Hmm. Nevertheless, I think I shall also have an early night. After Sir John Makewell retired to his cabin, Captain Boscombe went to the poop and peered through the darkness for the officer of the watch. Is that you, Williams? No, that's the mate, sir. Yeah, where's Williams? I sent him down below to rest, sir. I'm taking his watch for him. Why, what's the matter with the lad? Oh, he was complaining of sickness and a bad headache. I was going to report it to you, but you were in the saloon with Sir John Makewell. Uh, well, Williams can take your watch in the morning if he's fit. It's a fine night. I see we're making a fair speed. Wind holds. We can pass motor in four days, sir. Very good, but we'll not pass it. I'll put into Valletta for a day. Take on fresh provisions. Uh, do you uh, think there could be a sickness on board? What, uh, what makes you suggest that, Mr. Danton? Well, uh, it's not only Williams who's been feeling ill, sir. Oh? Three of the crew reported sick, all with the same symptoms. One man, Jack Weston, all his body is showing a rash. Oh, indeed. Well, it can't be the scurvy. They've been getting fresh vegetables and lime juice. Uh, you could well be right, Mr. Danton. Perhaps we have taken a sickness on board from Alexandria. Hi, Mr. Danton. What is it? The man I told you about last night, Captain. Yeah. A man called Weston. Told you he had a bad rash. Well, what are it, man? Is he worse? He's dead, sir. What? I've just checked the corpse. The rash had turned to, to large abscesses. He went blind before dying. Merciful heaven. He must be buried quickly before the humor spread from his body. That's not all, Captain. The men who reported sick with him last night are also suffering from body rashes. And Mr. Williams? The same. Right, they must be all isolated from the rest. See to it while I visit Sir John. I shall arrange for a meal to be brought to you, Sir John. Thank you, Captain, but now I don't feel like food or drink. Ah, oh, perhaps you'd feel better on deck. It's a beautiful car morning. I feel a little better only when I'm lying down. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain Boscombe, but 
I fear my daughter and I must have contracted this sickness before coming on board in Alexandria. It can be a foul place in the summer season. That could well be the case, Sir John. Some of the crew and one of my officers have been taken ill. Severely? Well, I think it's only fair to tell you the truth. One of them died not long ago. Died? Of the sickness from which I'm suffering? No, no, I couldn't say it was exactly the same. No, Sir John. He had a bad rash. A rash, you say? You mean like this? Sir John, you... Yes, just like that. My daughter. Have you seen her this morning? No, I thought she might be wanting to sleep. Quickly, help me. We must go to her at once. Captain Boscombe helped Sir John from the cabin and tried the door to Edith's cabin, but it was locked from the inside. Edith! Can you hear me, Edith? Edith, open the door! Uh, it's no good. We'll have to break it down. Stand back, Sir John. Oh, I can manage. Edith! Edith! What is it, Papa? You. You're all right, sir. A lot better than last night, praise be, but... Look what you've done to the door. Why didn't you open it when I knocked and called? I was still dressing. But you could have called. I did, but as you can see, it is a stark door, and, and you were making so much noise. Well, it's a relief to see you so much better, Miss Edith. Yes, yes, of course. Forgive me, my dear, we were fearing the worst. Is there a reason why you should? No, no, not really. If you kindly excuse me, I'll have the ship's carpenter repair the door. You don't look so very well, Papa. Oh, just a... Trifle tired, that's all. If you'll kindly take my arm and help me back to my cabin, I think I shall lie in until dinner. We'll have a short burial service for Weston on the forecastle. Has the boatswain stitched him up yet? There are two to be stitched up, sir. All right. Abercrombie died a few minutes ago. I doubt if Richards would last much longer. That's very serious, Danton. Oh. We must be afflicted with some kind of plague. Could well be so. Seven more men have reported sick, and the rest of the crew are showing signs of alarm. What if we're all struck down, sir? No, I doubt that, Mr. Danton. Even during the worst outbreaks of plague, there have always been those who survive. If you'll permit the suggestion, sir, I, I think we should make for port. Any port. No, not any port. A port where we can receive good medical assistance. We could turn back for Alexander. No, no, the wind's against us. I think Piraeus would be best. Two days sailing? it would take longer to turn back. Aye, I make a course for Piraeus. Let the crew know, will you? You should calm them down a little. Oh, but before you go, sir. Aye. Something else I think you should know. Not more bad news, surely? Your steward, the one who was serving you in the saloon last night, he uh, overheard your conversation with Sir John. Well, what of it? He told the crew about the statuette, the one they're calling the goddess of death. Ah, that's just superstition, nothing more. This is 1807, Mr. Danton, not 1307. Yes, but the crew are taking it seriously. But I think there is something in what they say. Oh, come, Danton, this is ridiculous. How can a simple metal statuette cause a plague like this? The men who have reported sick are the same men who carried it aboard, sir. And it was Weston and Abercrombie who repacked it in the hold. The ones who died. Mate was right. The crew were looking upon the statuette with superstitious dread. Some were for going down the hold and casting it over the side, until the sailing master asked who the brave lads were who were going to go down below and bring it up, thereby guaranteeing that they would be infected by its evil. None volunteered. Captain Boscombe was a wise old sea dog, though, and he mustered the crew together under the poop deck and told them of his plan to sail for Piraeus. Then, to prevent any hotheads from getting away from the ship by boat, he had the carpenter hammer holes in the hulls of the two jolly boats and the longboat. When the men were dismissed, he went to where Edith Makewell was standing at the stern rail. Aye, you're looking much better now, Miss Edith. I heard you talking to the crew, Captain. They're frightened men. Oh, superstition easily takes a hold on the uneducated, Miss. They wouldn't mutiny, would they? Ah, what good would that do them? I know already I'm making for the nearest convenient port. All the same, Captain, desperate and frightened men will do strange things. I know these men well enough. Some might have foolishly tried to escape by boat, but I put a stop to that. 
It seems strange that death can be so close by on such a beautiful day. Tell me, Miss Edith, did you eat anything after leaving the dining saloon last night before going to bed? No. Why do you ask? Why is it you've recovered so quickly yet all the others have succumbed? I see. No, I took nothing. Before luncheon, then. Perhaps during the afternoon. Let me see. No, nothing I can think of. Oh, I had an orange in the afternoon just before I began to feel ill. In fact, I thought that had been the cause. An orange? Well, I brought a small box full with me from Alexandria. I had developed a taste for them. Yes, and I had another orange when I awoke for a while in the middle of the night. But I see what you're thinking, Captain. You think the oranges helped me to conquer the sickness? Why, it is possible. We have no oranges on board. I feel they could provide us with the answer. Well, I have perhaps 20 left, but you're welcome to take them if you think they will well, help. I couldn't, not unless... Uh... Oh, give them to your crew. They can be cut into portions. Oh, please, Captain, I beg you. Even a wild chance is better than no chance at all. Very well, Miss Edith, and thank you kindly. The oranges were duly cut into portions and issued to every man on board. Boscombe had high hopes, since they seemed to be the only thing that had contributed to Edith Makewell's recovery. However, that evening, six more deaths were reported, and the news that many more men were ailing. Yes, yes, what is it? Oh, it's you, Miss Edith. Oh, Captain, come quickly. What? It's Father. I think he's dead. Oh, wait, let me put on my coat. Are you sure of this? Oh, no, but I can't wake him up. All right, come along with me. <laughs> I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. He was so alive. So full of ambition. Come. Come, let me take you to your cabin. No. I want to stay here. It would be better if you... He's my father. I want to be with him. Uh, very well, but I... Oh, here you are, Captain. I'm just coming along to call you. It's... Is something wrong? Sir? Aye, Sir John died during the night. Oh, very sorry, Miss Edith. What did you want to tell me? Has the coast been sighted? Uh, yes, that was part of it, sir. Uh, nine miles off the starboard bow. Uh, and the other part? Um, perhaps not in front of the ladies, sir. <clears throat> all right, come to my cabin then. Will you be all right, Miss Edith? Yes. Yes, I would rather be left alone for a little while. Well, what is it? I'm afraid that Sir John was not the only man to die during the night. Fourteen of the crew died as well. Fourteen? Fourteen men, Captain. And all of them, it seemed as though their flesh was rotting before they died. Ah, may heaven have mercy on us. We don't have enough men fit to man the yard arms. Well, then, every man will have to go aloft. The cook, the carpenter... The cook was the one who died, sir. The boatswain is on the verge of death. The sailing master has just collapsed on watch. No. We have eight fit men on board, including ourselves. I think we should go to one of those fishing ports and just sail in and to hell with it. Oh, Mr. Danton, I could never permit it. I must continue sailing for Piraeus. That's final, Mr. Danton. I shall follow your orders, Captain. But I must warn you that we will never arrive. In hours, we will not be able to man the ship. At noon that day, the captain began to feel ill. And soon after, blotches started to disfigure his face. The mate helped him to his cabin. Back on the poop, he summoned what few fit men he had left. Six, including himself. The captain has been taken ill. I have assumed command of the ship. I heard that right. Take us into land, Mr. Mate, so we can run from this cursed vessel. That is what I intend to do, Watson. There's a small fishing port some 15 miles to the west of us. We can reach it by nightfall if the wind holds. There we can abandon the ship, and from that time on, it will be every man for himself. But... You'll have to work like the devil up top. I want all the canvas out. Now get to it. Oh, excuse me, Captain Busker. Ah, uh, Mr. Danton. I'd like to see the chart you have for this coast. It's out on the table over there. Ah. Study it well. This is a bad place for reef. I'm sorry I took matters into my own hands, Captain. I could see no other way. No, no. I was just telling Miss Edith that perhaps you did the right thing. I cannot see myself ever reaching the poop deck again. Oh, come now, Captain. Have faith. I recovered, did I not? Lady is right, sir. All is not yet lost. Ah, yes. You're almost off this small promontory. 
As soon as we have it to beam, we can tack to starboard. Well, you beware those shoals, Mr. Danton. They can tear away the keel in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah, I can see where they're placed. There's a channel about two cables wide, which opens out again before Conrakis. Aye. You better have the sails prepared, sir, if you'll kindly excuse me. He's a good man, first-class seaman. If anyone can see you safely ashore, Joshua Danton's a man. I wish it were you. Well, now we're away with you. Get out on deck and help them to watch for the shoals. Yes, I'll do what I can. It's right good of you to offer to help out, miss. If you'll stand there by the rail and watch for the small, choppy ways, right. that's where the shoals will be. Edwards! Aye. Take out the lead. Come on, be quick about it. All right, lads, I'll help you with the rope. Are you ready now? Right, all together now. Heave! Heave! Hard over on the wheel there. Wheel hard to starboard, sir. Ah, she's coming round. By heavens, the old girl is coming round. Belay the rope, Ashton. Right, sir. Midship's wheel. Wheel, midship, sir. I can see choppy water. Where? How far away? There, that way, about 50 yards. All right, we'll clear it. No, no, you won't. You'd better look out for yourself. The chubby water stretches from there right across the bow. No, it can't, according to the chart. Stand to the stage. <laughs> Brig squarely hit the jagged teeth of an underwater reef. Those few who managed to swim away from the wreck were soon dashed and mangled by the sharp points of slightly submerged rock. And now, almost 180 years later, when we dived to study the wreck of the Mary Dean, one of my team carried with him a Geiger counter. For, with the hunt being on for mineral discoveries under the sea, one never misses an opportunity to make a chance find. This diver thought he had made such a find, because the Geiger counter reacted strongly amid the wreckage. So strongly, indeed, that the amount of radioactivity was far above the human tolerance level. Using a remote-controlled TV probe, we discovered the statuette of the minor goddess, Ranita. It was made of a metal lethally radioactive. The diving operation was shut down, and a report was prepared for the British and Greek governments. A special lead container was constructed last year and lowered down to the wreck of the Mary Dean. The statuette was placed inside and only then brought finally to the surface. This container was taken in great secrecy to the Atomic Research Laboratories at Huntington, and there it remains to this day, a mystery that might never be solved. But what was Renita really? With such an enormous amount of radioactivity being emitted, no wonder the Egyptians called her... The goddess of death. As for the stone coating in which it had been found in the desert, samples of this were found and studied. It turned out to be a special cement, unknown to present-day science, and able to reflect and contain radioactivity. Where did Ranita come from? Earth? That seems doubtful. One could speculate endlessly, but on one thing I'm sure... We will only know the truth in years to come. And only then, if the powers that be consider it in the public interest to know. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.